Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this is a video for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. This is for Chapter 3 of our book on infancy, and this is Part 2 about physical development in infancy. The first thing you hear is uh, the sequence of physical development going from two months uh, still a fetus up to 16 years old. And there are a few different patterns. Number one, of course, you can see here the proportions change dramatically that the head accounts for half the size at uh, two months. Um, I want to talk about three different sequences, uh, patterns of development. The first one is cephalo cephalocaudal. That means from head to tail. And cephalocaudal development means that the head uh, grows first, um, and then that the other parts of the body that are below it grow later. And this is logical, especially since the brain regulates uh, functions like heartbeat that are essential for the growth of the rest of the body. The second one is proxima distal, and this means things take place from the trunk, the, the torso, outward. And so, for instance, you see that arms are much shorter relative to body size, uh, way over on the left uh, as opposed to on the right. And this, again, makes sense because nerves have to develop from the spinal cord and spread out before the infants can control their arms or their legs. And also, life functions um, like uh, breathing, the heart, those things are all right there in the central axis, and so it makes sense to get those developed first. Uh, the third uh, pattern is differentiation. And this is, as children become more mature, their physical reactions, again, the example we had was touching a hot stove for a very young child. It's a global response. The whole body thrashes. On the other hand, as they get older, it becomes a more specific response, just the part of the um, uh, body that actually touched the stove. Uh, they may still, they still cry, but that's the part that takes place uh, where the movement takes place. Also, I want to look at changes in weight. Um, infants usually double their birth weight in about five months, and they triple it by their first birthday. Also, their height increases by about 50% in the first year. So a child whose length of birth was 20 inches is likely to be about 30 inches tall at 12 months. And then among newborns, the arms and legs are about equal in length. You can see that here on our newborn, the third one from the left. And each is only about one and a half times the length of the head. Now, by the first birthday, the, the neck has begun to lengthen, except the arms and legs, and the arms grow more rapidly than the legs at first, and by the second birthday, the arms are actually longer than the legs. Um, you see the proportions change over time. The next thing is about the failure to thrive, uh, abbreviated FTT. And Failure to thrive is a serious disorder. It impairs growth in infancy and in early childhood, and its causes can be either biological or non-biological. They call it organic or non-organic. But usually, feeding problems are at the core of the whole thing. And failure to thrive is linked not only to slow physical growth, but to cognitive, behavioral, and emotional problems. As we talked about in class, though, especially for organic failure to thrive, where it's a biological cause, um, if those causes are addressed, then the child is actually able to often catch up uh, in their development. Okay, the next thing here is about nutrition, and we want to talk a little bit about uh, breastfeeding versus uh, bottles. Now, there's a lot of advantages to breast milk, and there are some disadvantages. The advantages are that breast milk is less likely to upset an infant's stomach. It has antibodies that can uh, help ward off some problems. It actually protects against lymphoma, a serious thing. It also, fewer digestive problems, fewer allergic responses, and interestingly, a decreased chance for obesity later in life. I think that's interesting because breast milk is incredibly high in fat, but that has more to do with neurological development than anything. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are disadvantages to breastfeeding. These are things that people need to keep in mind. One, of course, is that if the mother is drinking or taking some kind of either prescription medication or uh, recreational drugs, those can be passed along through the milk. And then if the mother has a disease like HIV, that can be passed along through the breast milk. Um, and so you've got to be very careful and properly talk with the doctor before uh, you see breastfeed to see what sorts of things could be transmitted. Um, also, the mothers have to have adequate nourishment for the milk to be uh, good. Um, their, you know, sort of what goes in has to be sufficient. Also, um, simply producing milk, for the body to produce milk, is physically demanding as well as, uh, there are other things we talked about, for instance, like the advantages of a bottle is that other people can feed the baby or uh, 
it, the baby does not have to be fed through the breast immediately at the time it's hungry. So, for instance, if you're at work or on the bus or something, you can put off till later. Um, on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of uh, very strong feelings about breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. It's just something that uh, if you get to the point where you have children of your own, that you need to explore the two possibilities pretty thoroughly. Next, I want to talk about development of the brain and the nervous system. Now, what we have here, the basic unit of the nervous system is a neuron. And a neuron, um, they receive and transmit messages from other neurons or other parts of the body to one another. And babies are born with about 100 billion neurons, most of which are in the brain, and that's pretty much the quantity that you're going to have for the rest of your life. Now, each neuron has a cell body. That's the big part here at the top. They have dendrites, which are the little branchy things. In fact, dendrite is Greek for branch, um, that just reach out to the other neurons. And um, they have an axon. That's the long, skinny part. And then axon terminals are like dendrites at the other end that connect with the dendrites of other neurons. And um, some axons, like this one right here, are encased by a myelin sheath. And then through myelination, which, by the way, is made of fat, which is one of the reasons that fat's so important in a baby's diet, uh, through myelination, communication become, between neurons can become more efficient. Also, it provides uh, insulation. These, these are electrochemical impulses, and this provides a form of insulation that protects uh, neurons uh, from cross-firing, which is uh, one of the symptoms, by the way, of multiple sclerosis. Um, also, myelination in the prefrontal cortex continues into the second decade of life, um, and it's connected with a lot of advances in working memory and language ability. In fact, let's look at growth here. Uh, we have the, the patterns of growth, and what you see in this one is that the brain of a newborn will triple in weight by one year. I mean, their, their heads are really big when they're born, but there's so much more going on. And what happens here is not so much that they're, they're not getting more neurons. What they are is they're getting a tremendous amount of growth in both the myelination and in the dendrites and the connections. Uh, it's that density of interconnections that's really critical. And so uh, the neurons, they form, they proliferate, um, but the growth spurt you see here is the dendrites and the axon terminals. Also, myelination continues. Um, it results in the continued development of intentional physical activity as the newborn is better able to control their movement. So it's very unorganized and global and not specific. And the myelination makes it uh, so they can control it better. They become increasingly capable of complex and integrated sensory motor activities as well. Besides, brain development uh, reflects both nature, such as just through biological maturation, and nurture, such as through stimulation, nutrition, and so on. Um, in fact, let's look at uh, the rest of physical growth. We're going to talk about motor development. Motor means moving here. And infants make massive strides in motor abilities within the first year of life. They go from being very helpless to being very mobile, making very purposeful movements all within a few years. And although most neonates or newborns can't support even their own neck, that's resolved within a few months. Uh, they can track objects with their eyes, but it takes about six months to be successful at grasping objects. And that's when they begin rolling over, and shortly after, they can begin sitting up. Crawling for most children begins around eight or nine months, and most can stand at 10 months old. Uh, and then somewhere around 12 to 15 months, most are walking by themselves, which gets them the name of toddler. Now, there's an interesting exception to this whole uh, progression here, and this is from a study done in 1940 by Wayne and Marcena Dennis. Um, they studied Native American Hopi children who spent their entire first year strapped to a cradle board and consequently didn't engage in any form of motor activity or locomotion. They found that despite uh, having really this, uh, this major setback, um, not having physical experiences per se, that these children, when they got out of the cradle board, they, they quickly caught up with others in terms of walking, and there were really no noticeable differences one way or the other. Okay, sensory and perceptual development. This last slide for this particular section. Um, vision. Let's say dramatic, uh, excuse me, dramatic gains in visual acuity. Uh, between birth and six months of age. Remember, they're very uh, nearsighted. They can't see well. Uh, also, peripheral vision is very poor at birth, but by six months of age, it's the same as an adult. 
Um, also, infants generally respond to cues for depth by the time they're able to crawl, six to eight months old. And so what you have here, for instance, is the visual cliff. You see we've got this piece of uh, glass or plastic that goes across, and the pattern shows that it dips down. Now, a very, very young child would not be able to really see that we have this dip down here. But it's wonderful that by the time children are old enough to crawl, they're also able to respond well to depth cues, and so they're basically not going to go across. Um, also, we have things about um, size and shape constancy. That means that even though the image on the eyeballs can be very different, um, people can tell that something stays the same size and it has the same shape, even if you're going closer or farther away or walking around it and that gets developed. And that actually is a very sophisticated cognitive procedure. Also, a hearing. At birth, uh, newborns can orient their heads in the direction of a sound, um, as long as they're lying down, because it's hard for them, they can't hold up their head. And then by 18 months, their sound localizing abilities are basically the same as adults. Their range of pitch of sounds gradually expands, uh, as does their ability to detect differences in pitch and loudness. And that's where we're going to stop this section.